dismissed. The rest of you folks, I want you to open up your Bibles to the last book of the Bible, the book of the Revelation. And we're going to go right to the very last chapter of the book of the Revelation, chapter 22. And I'm going to read verse 14, but I'm going to read throughout the whole chapter. Now, my message is entitled, Are You Marching to Zion? And I was going to name it, like Louis Armstrong, when the saints go marching in. Uh, in my dissertation, my doctoral dissertation uh, for my PhD, I, one chapter I had uh, was called Raining in, uh, Walking in the Rain. That is the R-E-I-G-N, showing uh, the transition from Sunday, for, excuse me, from Sabbath to Sunday, but my last chapter was Walking in the Rain. <laughs> oh, I thought it was funny. Anyway, <laughs> you bunch of fuddy-duddies. All right, Revelation chapter 22, verse 14. Are you marching to Zion? Let's all stand up, please, for the reading of God's word. The Bible says in verse 14, Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have a right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city. That is the heavenly city. Our Father and our God, we thank you for the infallible Word of God, and we thank you for the writing of the Apocalypse and these words from the very mouth of our blessed Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And Lord, as we consider this subject today, are you marching to Zion? Father, I pray that you stir us up. Lord, that you reveal yourself to us. And Lord, that you strengthen us mightily by thy grace and spirit with might and both the inner man and the elder man, for we ask it in Christ our Savior's name. Amen. Well, beloved, if you read, were to read the book of the Revelation, you would find that there are seven Beatitudes in the book of the Revelation, or seven blessings. And this is the last Beatitude, the last blessing of the last book of the Bible. And it shows the final reward, the final blessing for faithfulness to God for those who have placed their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, folks, since the fall of Adam and Eve and their banishment from the Garden of Eden, all men, all men everywhere have been on a spiritual journey in life. They're spending an eternity somewhere, whether or not they know it. Now, a lot of folks are ignorant of that fact, but that's just true. Amen? You see, we all have an eternal destiny that awaits us. You're either marching to uh, the heavenly Zion and trying, or you're marching to hell, dying and frying. And I don't say that for levity. Because that's the truth. And so I exhort you to embrace the former and, of course, eschew the latter. Now, beloved, the heavenly Zion is the celestial city of God. It's the holy city of God. It's called the New Jerusalem. It's the eternal abode of God, the eternal abode of God's people. It's the place where God lives in heaven, of which the earthly city of Zion, or Jerusalem, was a type of where God lived on earth in the Old Testament in the temple. Yet scripture is clear that there are only two choices in life. There are only two destinies in life men are headed for. You say, what's that, Pastor? Well, the Bible is clear. It's either heaven or hell. Beloved, there is no such place as purgatory. That did not come to the church until the fourth century. The church had been established for 400 years before that heresy came in. There is no nirvana. There is no such thing as uh, nihilism, as I taught you last week, or annihilationism, where you're just going to die and disintegrate, and you'll never exist again. The Bible says that there is only heaven or hell, unfortunately. All men, all men are sinners by both nature and choice, and, beloved, they are in desperate need of a Savior to rescue them from the penalty and power of sin, and namely, of course, that was the Jesus Christ himself. Amen. He was God's perfect man. He is man's perfect God. And that's why he's called both the son of man and the son of God. Would you say amen out there? And so he died on the cross to pay the penalty for our sins as our sacrifice, our substitute, and our sin bearer. Now the cross that I, we see behind me, this cross right here is our tree of life on earth. It gives us moral life, it gives us spiritual life, and it gives us eternal life by the power of God's Spirit. Would you say amen out there? So, beloved, therefore, when we repent of our sins 
and we place our faith and our trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, and we confess Him as our Savior and Lord. And I've always taught you, man needs a Savior before he needs a Lord. Amen? But when we do that, beloved, and then we're baptized into Christ, we are saved. God in His great mercy, God in His great grace now forgives us, and He cleanses us from all of our sins through the sinless, shameless, guiltless, blameless blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we now become a child of God, beloved, and praise the Lord, we become a citizen of the heavenly Zion. Would you say amen out there? The Bible says our name is then written in that heavenly register, the book of life. So when we place and keep our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, beloved, it shows that we are indeed marching to Zion, that we have something set before us. There are not only marching to Zion, that we know that we're going toward the heavenly city of God. Jesus said it this way, that when you repent and come to know Christ as your Savior, beloved, you are now on the narrow road to heaven. You're no longer on the broad road that leads to hell that most folks are on and don't even know it. Hence now in our spiritual journey as strangers and pilgrims on earth, and now begins, beloved. And like our our spiritual father Abraham, we too also now look for a better country, a city which has foundations whose builder and maker is God. Can you imagine all the way back in the Old Testament when God called Abraham, and remember Abraham was not a Jew, he was a Gentile. Abraham was called a Hebrew, one who crosses over the Euphrates or the Euphrates River. But he listened to God and he obeyed God. He didn't have a Bible and he didn't have a church, beloved. He didn't have radios, he didn't have tracts, but he listened to what God had said. And he had heard stories all the way from the Garden of Eden about this one true living God. Would you say amen out there? So when he went into the land of Canaan, he says, I'm not looking to spend my eternity here. I'm looking for a better country. I'm looking for a heavenly city whose builder and maker is God himself. Amen. And that is exactly what John in the apocalypse here is speaking about. That is the new Jerusalem, the heavenly city of God that he's prepared for all those who truly love him and show up by obeying and following him, beloved. And also like Moses, we now endure in the spiritual battle through faith as seeing him who is invisible until we finally reach the promised land of the heavenly Canaan. As the children of Israel have their exodus from Egypt going to the promised land of the earthly Canaan, you and I get saved out of this world, which is a type of Egypt, and we are now marching to the heavenly Canaan. Would you say amen out there? But make no mistake about this, ladies and gentlemen. Until we finally reach our ultimate destination in heaven, until we finally lay hold on that eternal life and enter into the gates, uh, uh, into the heavenly city, beloved, the true people of God will be in a real spiritual battle. You say, Pastor Joel, who are our enemies? Well, the Bible's clear on it. Our enemies are sin, Satan, self, that is the flesh. This evil world system, who every step of the way are going to try to tempt you, try to trip you up to rob your soul and prevent you from ever reaching the heavenly city of God. You were not in that battle until the day you got saved. Amen? Amen. Now, beloved, you're going to meet the enemy head on. And you know what I'm talking about. And that's why some seven times in the book of the Revelation, The Lord Jesus Christ himself exhorts us. Now, seven times he says, be overcomers, be overcomers. To him that overcomes, to him that overcomes. He didn't say to him who succumbs. He didn't say to him who was overcame. He says, be ye an overcomer to him that overcomes. In 1 John chapter 4, verse 4, the Bible says, greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Amen. Greater is he that is in you, that's the Holy Spirit of the living God, of the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, than he that is in the world. So, beloved, our Lord has not left us defenseless in the spiritual battle to be able to conquer all the enemies that we're going to encounter. He's given us the supernatural power of his spirit and grace to divinely enable and empower us to trust him and follow him and obey him so we can be overcomers in the spiritual battle. He's given us, bless God, the Holy Word of God, the Bible to morally and spiritually teach us and guide us uh, with His light so we can be overcomers in the spiritual battle. 
And beloved, he's given us the whole armor of God to put on. And he's given us his mighty angels so we can fight the good fight of faith and persevere in the faith so we can be overcomers in the spiritual battle. Would you say amen out there? The Bible says we can be more than conquerors to whom that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall ever be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. That's Romans 8, 38, 39. So God always causes us to triumph in Christ if we will but yield to him. Would you say amen out there? And beloved, he's given us every spiritual means and an internal desire and ability to help us persevere in the faith. And that's the key, isn't it? It is not how you begin the race. It is how you finish it. Remember, the Christian walk is not a sprint. It is a marathon. Now, a lot of people, I remember when I first got saved, everybody was talking about a pre-tribulation rapture. I said, whew, I'll be out of here soon. That was 40, almost 45 years ago now. I said, you are still here. (laughs) You see, beloved, that's why in Philippians chapter 2, verses 12 and 13, Paul said this. He said, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God that worketh in you both the will and to do of his good pleasure. He didn't say work for your salvation. He said work out that salvation that God has already worked in. And he says, motivating you both to will and divinely enabling you and empowering you to do his good pleasure. So it is God at work inside of us. Would you say amen out there? So what are you saying, preacher? I'm saying that the saints are not left to fight and fend for themselves in the spiritual battle as we march to Zion, the heavenly city of God. But oh, hear me now. It is utterly impossible. What did I say? It's what? Utterly what? impossible for man to ever save or sanctify himself to be able to make it into the eternal city and kingdom of God. He is totally dependent on God to be able to do this. Now, a lot of people think if I'm religious enough or if I'm good enough, beloved, that's not going to save you. You're still a sinner. You broke God's law. You need to be redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Amen? So there's no possible way. You've got to come to Christ then. Because before that, God says, all your righteousness in Isaiah 64, 6, is nothing but filthy leprous and menstrual rags. God says, that's what, in his sight, that's how holy our God is. So what are you saying, preacher? I'm saying it's through the supernatural power of God's spirit and grace that we are called unto salvation. And the Bible says, with a high calling, with a holy calling, we're called with a heavenly calling. And it's through the supernatural power of God's Spirit and grace that we can constantly and continuously be able to believe and obey the gospel and the commandments of God. You're emphasizing this for a reason, Pastor Joel. Uh Uh-huh, because I have a lot of critics out there. And you know how they love the truth words and parse words. And it's through the supernatural power of God's Spirit that we're constantly and continuously enabled to defeat all of our enemies and continue as overcomers in our spiritual journey and pilgrimage to Zion, the heavenly city of God. But, beloved, through faith, we as Christians must constantly and continuously yield our wills and ourselves to God and reckon ourselves dead indeed to sin and alive unto God through Jesus Christ and then utilize and cooperate with the supernatural power and means of God's spirit and grace to be victorious in the spiritual battle so we can indeed reach our heavenly destination. Would you say amen out there? If you were broke and you couldn't pay your rent and I had a million dollars and I do, I'm rich. (laughs) Okay? Beloved, all the money I would have wouldn't do you one good if you didn't come up here and get some. I don't want to be rushed right now, okay? But it would do you one good. It's the same thing when you get saved. All the power is available to you. You have to want to want it. You have to yield. You have to reckon. You have to utilize. See, you have to do it. And how do you do it? You do it through faith. Where would you get the faith? By God, would you say amen? Every man is given a measure of faith. So through faith, we must constantly and continuously let the person and the power of God's supernatural spiritual uh, spirit and grace work in us and work with us and work through us. This is how we allow him to save and sanctify us. Would you say amen out there? 
So, beloved, are you marching to Zion like this, or are you just meandering and dying in your moral and spiritual life? If so, beloved, then you're never going to reach the celestial city. you got to fight. you got to get in the battle. That's just the way it is. I didn't make the rules. I have to do the same thing. Now, I want you to notice six truths about this question. Are you marching to Zion? What saith the Scriptures? That's what it comes down to. Amen? First thing I want you to see is the paradise insured. The paradise insured. Look what the Bible says in Revelation chapter 22, verses 12 and 14. This is Jesus speaking. He says, And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me to give to every man according to, say it with me, his work, as his work shall be. Verse 14, Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have a right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city. Beloved, when Adam and Eve sinned and were thus banished from the Garden of Eden, that was what we call paradise lost. But, I should say, that perfect utopia of living with God and living in the very presence of God was now gone. But at the second advent, when Jesus Christ returns, beloved, he's going to reverse the curse and create a new heavens and a new earth. And the Bible says paradise lost will be now paradise found. Would you say amen? amen. We're going to gain more from Jesus than we ever lost from Adam. Now, since the fall, God has always wanted to redeem man. God has always wanted to reconnect with man through his Messiah, his Mashiach. And of course, we know the Mashiach, Yeshua HaMashiach. I, I was talking to a person one day, and he was trying to impress me with his Hebrew, right? And he says, well, you know, the Hebrew says Yeshua. I says, I'm positive. No, he says, the Hebrew says Yeshua. I says, that's not Hebrew. It's Hebrew is Yehushua. He says, it is? I says, I thought you were the one that said you knew all this Hebrew. The word Yeshua is Aramaic. What is it? It's Aramaic. Yehushua is Mamma Mia. That's Italian. Mamma Mia, okay. Hi, <laughs> vey, that's Jewish, okay. All right. We see, beloved, God has always wanted to reconnect with man. And as we study the drama of the sanctuary in the Old Testament, Every sacrifice, every blood sacrifice, every ceremony, every offering pointed to the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, whom John the Baptist said was the Lamb of God who taketh away the sin of the world. And now, folks, through faith in His finished work on the cross and the redemptive merits of His blood, Scripture promises man that he can be redeemed and he can be reconciled back to God and once again live in His very presence. Where, preacher? in the paradise of God. Where am I going to live with him? In the heavenly Canaan and the promised land. Where? In the heavenly Zion. Where? In the celestial and holy city of God, the new Jerusalem, the eternal abode of God and his people. And it will be the capital city of the new heavens and the new earth. The new Jerusalem. The holy city. The heavenly Zion. Many names it's called uh, in scripture. Amen. But, beloved, the Bible says that in the heavenly and holy city of God, there are great big and high and long impregnable walls. It's a cube. It's 1,400 miles long, 1,400 miles high, 1,400 miles wide. In other words, what God is trying to signify is you will be eternally secure. You see, beloved, we don't believe in eternal security. That you're secure in eternity. That's what the Bible teaches, all right? But in all the cities of the Bible, they used to put walls around them for what? Okay, we'll take the wall around Babylon. That was 70 feet high, 35 feet thick. They could drive four chariots abreast on it. This is 1,400 miles high. <laughs> Nobody's going to scale that one, okay? In other words, God is trying to convey to us how secure we're going to be in the heavenly city. Amen? And there in the heavenly city, beloved, the Bible says there'll be streets of gold. Now, I know some of you are going to be prying some up with your knives and stuff like that and trying to cash them in, but you won't have to worry about it. There's a lot, of, a lot of gold there. And the Bible also says that in the heavenly city, there's going to be pearly gates. And, beloved, the Bible says there will be myriads of angels and myriads of saints, and the whole triunity of the Godhead will be there in the heavenly city. But the greatest blessing of living in the holy city is this. 
It is what is known in theology as the beatific vision. The reformers call it the visio dei, that is now being able to see God face to face in all of his unveiled, all of his undiminished glory, and basking in the presence of his infinite love. God told Moses, no man can see my face and live. If we were to stand in the presence of a holy God who's a thousand times brighter than the sun, who set that sun on fire, you and I, the Bible says in Revelation, uh, excuse me, in Zechariah, that we would spontaneously combust. But when we are glorified and have a body like Jesus, we'll be able to do it. And we'll experience that beatific vision. Oh, beloved, every day when I pray to God and I say, Lord, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Oh, show me your glory. Show me like Moses when I say it. But someday I'm going to be able to see God face to face and so won't you. Moreover, beloved, the Bible continuously speaks about the breath of life and it speaks about the bread of life and the book of life. The Bible speaks of the water of life and the word of life, and it speaks of the spirit of life. But here, it speaks of the tree of life. I want you to look at verse 14 again. He says, Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have a right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates of the city. Now, drop right down to verse number 2 of the same chapter, Revelation 22. And in the midst of the street, that is, of the holy city, and on either side of the river there was the tree of life, which bare twelve manner of fruits, and yielded her fruit every month. And the leaves of the trees were for the healing of the nations. Now, beloved, notice this perennial tree of life. It says bears twelve manner of monthly fruits and leaves, and it's for the healing of the nations. When Adam and Eve were expelled from the Garden of Eden, beloved, they lost access to the tree of life. Why is that, Pastor? Lest they eat of it and forever live in the pain and in the misery and in the consequences of their sin. Can you imagine getting cancer, beloved, with all of the pain that may be with it and never, ever being able to escape from it? It was the mercy of God that he cursed man when he broke uh, the commandment and ate of the tree of life. But throughout the book of Proverbs, beloved, it also speaks of the book of life. And I can't take you there. We don't have the time. But it says that obtaining God's wisdom is a tree of life for you. It says obtaining God's knowledge and his understanding is a tree of life for you. It says obtaining his gentle tongue, knowing how to answer a person, is a tree of life to you. And it says obtaining God's righteousness is a tree of life to you. Would you say amen out there? And now here, beloved, in Revelation chapter 2 and verse 7, if you write it down, it says, To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Would you say amen? So to enter into the gates of the holy city, the kingdom of God, and to now eat of the fruits of the tree of life signifies that it will forever impart unto you supernatural, spiritual, and eternal life and nourishment, the nourishment of God to infinitely sustain you in the next life in your glorified state. We know Isaiah 66, the Bible says from one new moon to another, so that means even though it's eternity, there's going to be time that will be calibrated. And from one Sabbath to the next, so that means it will be month to month, week to week, amen? So here he is, right in the midst of the paradise of God, is the tree of life that bears perennial fruit, and the fruit and the leaves of it are for the healings of the nations to sustain you. Would you say amen out there? You see, beloved, this is the paradise assured by Christ. This is the paradise secured by Christ. This is the paradise insured and guaranteed by the Lord Jesus Christ to all of the faithful who love him and who follow him and obey him. You know, we sing, it will be worth it all when we see Jesus. Life trials will seem so small. If you want me to keep singing 50 cents, I'll sing it outside for you later. No. Hey, it'll be worth it all when we see Jesus, amen. So my question is this, are you marching to Zion or are you living for and dying in this world? That's point number one, beloved, the paradise insured. Number two, I want you to see the personal inviter. Look at verses 16 through 17a. 
It says, I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright and morning star. And the spirit and the bride say, come. And let him that heareth say, come. Beloved, the Lord Jesus Christ himself, in Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 through 30, said this, Come unto me, all ye that labor and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, and learn of me, for I am meek and lonely of heart, and you shall find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light, but it is still a yoke, and that's no yoke. Right? It's still a yoke. What are you saying to me, preacher? I'm saying he who invited men to come to him while he was on earth now invites them from heaven with the same urgency, with the same love, with the same promises, beloved. He invites us to salvation. He invites us to his heaven. He invites us to inherit eternal life. He invites us to enter the holy city and kingdom of God, beloved. And he invites us to eat of the tree of life and to drink of the water of life. I want to jump in that river, don't you? Ezekiel says that that river goes right through the city. And John in the, in the uh, Revelation echoes that truth and says there is a river that runs right through the midst of that city. And I'm not just going to drink, I'm going to jump in. How about <laughs> do a little backstroke? <laughs> you see, beloved, he wants us to know that he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And that he's still calling and willing to receive sinners who will repent and follow him into eternity and into glory. Is that you? I hope you can say amen. And he assures us that there is still joy in heaven over one sinner who repents. Can you imagine that? A person repents, they get themselves right, and heaven is all clapping their hands. Woo-wee! I can just see Gabriel. Glory to God. You see that? God says, no, I'm only omniscient. <laughs> But can you imagine that, beloved? The Bible says there's joy in heaven over one sinner who repents. Now, what is John showing us here? He's showing us that throughout this age, that Christ himself, that the Holy Spirit, that the church, the bride of Christ, is always through the gospel calling us, beckoning us, inviting us sinners to come unto him to be saved and sanctified. Why? Because it may be too late someday. Time is running out, beloved. Because when he returns, he's going to institute the day of judgment. That great and terrible and notable day of the Lord that the Bible speaks about. And that's where all humanity right now, that's where we're heading. is a collision course with the creator of the universe. But if we know the Lord, hallelujah, amen, we don't have to worry about it. Now, beloved, I want you to look at verse 11. The Bible says, he that is unjust when Jesus comes... Let him be unjust still. And he which is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, notice what he says, let him be holy still. In other words, the moral and spiritual state that Christ finds you in when you either die or he returns is the state you're going to be in forever and eternity. You will be flash frozen in that state. Now it will be irreversible. Now, ladies and gentlemen, it will be irremediable. Now it will be irreparable and permanent. So if you're ever going to repent, if you're ever going to come to Christ, the Bible again and again and again says now, do it now. Today is the day of salvation. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 6, 2, Behold, now is the the accepted time. Behold, Today, now, is the day of salvation. Would you say amen out there? I want you to look at verse 17a, if you would, again, please. He says, And the Spirit and the bride say, Come, and let him that heareth say, Come. Now, the word heareth is the Greek word akuo. And it means this, beloved. I want you to listen to what I'm saying here, because a lot of people miss this. This word akuo is a present tense verb that shows constant and continuous action on the part of man. Meaning this, you must both hear and keep on hearing. Does that sound like you? It means you must heed and keep on hearing. Does that sound like you? That's all what this Greek word means. 
Beloved, it means this. It means that you must consider and keep on considering. Sound like you? Ladies and gentlemen, it means you must come and keep on coming. Does it sound like you? In other words, this is not a one-time act of faith, as a lot of people, th unfortunately, think it is. What he's speaking about here, ladies and gentlemen, is a whole lifetime of faith and faithfulness to God. So I ask you this morning what Jesus says. He says, do you hear? Do you hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches? Do you hear what he's saying? I hope so. You folks watching by television, do you hear what the Spirit is saying to you on your couch that you can't get off of to come to church? Do you hear what the Spirit saith under the churches. I hope you can say amen to that. But I also want you to notice this about verse 17, beloved. And don't you miss this, that this is the last call, that this is the last invitation by Christ for anyone to get saved, to ever live in the city of God and to eat of the tree of life. So are you marching to Zion? Do you hear what the Spirit is saying unto you? Thirdly, beloved, not only the paradise insured and the personal inviter, but I want you to see the persons invited in verse 17b. He says, and whosoever will, excuse me, and let him that is a thirst come, and whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. Beloved, you know the great commission that Christ gave his apostles, that he gives his church, is a universal call to salvation to all men everywhere. Now, unlike what the Calvinist says, it is a limited atonement. It's limited by man, but the provision is unlimited by God. But it's an open invitation by Christ to two types of people. Notice what he says here. Number one, those who are athirst. That dipsao is the Greek word, and it means to all those who yearn, all those who burn and long to be free and long to be forgiven of their sins by God and long to go to heaven. Hey, beloved, that sound like you? Do you want to break that besetting sin in your life? Do you yearn for it? Do you burn like that? Do you long to be set free from the shackles of those sins in your life? Because that's what he's talking about here. Number two, not only him that is a thirst, notice what he says, the whosoever wills. Thaleo is the Greek word. It means anyone, at any time, anywhere, no matter what they did. That is, if you believe the gospel, if you will repent of your sin and confess Christ as your Savior and Lord and be baptized into Christ for the remission of sins and the gift of the Holy Ghost, now and faithfully follow and obey Him throughout your life, then this invitation and acceptance extends to you. If you're willing to do that, to obey what God said to you, God says, this is the invitation that I'm giving you. But you have to want to do it. You see, beloved, what I'm saying to you is you cannot out -sin the cleansing power of the blood and grace of God in Christ. A lot of people think, my sins are so heinous, God will never forgive me. Beloved, the only sin God can't forgive you of is unbelief. If you believe, beloved, and you, I mean you keep believe as a verb, but not a noun. If you believe and keep on believing, I want to tell you, he'll be forgiven, keep on forgiving. Would you say amen out there? You see, beloved, but you must accept his invitation and then respond to his call, and respond to his call. In other words, as he beckons me from heaven, and I start jogging, I'm starting to go to heaven, and he's calling, I'm still what? Uh, uh, no, no, I'm still doing what? I'm still, I'm still jogging. That's probably the first time since I was 55 I've done that. <laughs> I'm 56 now, so. No, but beloved, what I'm saying to you, see, Christ is always beckoning us from heaven. Come, come unto me, come unto me, come unto me. But you have to hear what the Spirit of God is saying to you. Would you say amen out there? You see, beloved, God forgives the penitent murderer. We know that Moses was a murderer. Paul was a murderer. And God forgave them. And he forgives the penitent drunk and addict and the pervert. And he forgives the penitent fornicator and homosexual and the whore. And he forgives the penitent thief and criminal and sinner and backslider, beloved. No matter what you did, God said, if you come unto me like I said and keep coming to me, I'll keep forgiving you and I'll cleanse you. I love what the gospel of Isaiah says in Isaiah 55, 1. 
God himself speaking. He says, Ho, ho, everyone that thirsteth, come ye to the waters. And then he goes on and says a lot about bread and bread, but he says, come ye and drink freely. If you thirst, and you want the water of life, God says it's yours. Come to the fountain, come to the source, come to the font and drink of the water of life freely. Would you say amen out there? Beloved, I want you to look, if you would please, at verses 1 and 2, because again we see about the water and the tree of life. In chapter 22 of Revelation, in verses 1 and 2, And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb, in the midst of the street of it, of the city of God. And on either side of the river was there the tree of life, which bare twelve manner of fruits, and yielded her fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. Now, beloved, notice, running right from the very throne of God in Christ, and right through the very midst of the new Jerusalem and city of God, is the pure river of the water of life. What does it do? So there is a river. Well, beloved, that eternally cleanses you, that eternally washes and purifies you, that eternally refreshes you and revives you and enlivens you. I'm saying all those penitent sinners who have now become saints, beloved, and persevere in the faith, now they can come and eat of that tree, and they can come and drink of that river, and they can do it and do it until their hearts contend. Would you say amen out there? Hey, are you marching to Zion? Are you marching to Zion? I hope you can say amen, preacher. Fourthly, beloved, what I want you to see, oh, but that's, that was, what was it, number two I gave you, right? I gave you number two? Did I give you number three? How many say number two? We have five, we have five, we have sold American. Number four, beloved, the privileged individuals. The privileged individuals. Look at verses 12 and 14. Jesus says, and behold, I come quickly, and my reward, by the way, that shows me he's already made some kind of a judgment, Amen. My reward is with me to give to every man according as his work shall be. Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have a right to the tree of life, <coughs> excuse me, and may enter in to the gates of the city. And I say, oh, oh, what a divine promise that is. Amen. God rewards the works done by those who have allowed who have utilized the power of his supernatural spirit and grace to work in, with, and through them. You see, beloved, God is rewarding his own grace in you is what he's doing. Notice it says that blessed, makarios, is the Greek word. It means to be supremely happy, fortunate, to be envied are those who through faith, who constantly and continuously utilize the supernatural power of God's spirit and grace to obey his commandments. Beloved, anybody who's been in the service knows, you know, I know in the Marine Corps, you come off the street, they do everything they can. When the bus pulls up, I'll never forget, we, we finally got to D.C. They put us on a bus, they put us down to Paris Island. Everybody's laughing and joking or whatever. And then the bus stops at the end of, the, right before you get into Paris Island, there's these great huge pillars. Was it that way with you, brother? And it says, welcome to Paris Island. There's just willow trees that are leap, leaping. That was a foretaste of what was to come. They're just kind of like this here, right? As soon as that bus turned the corner, you could have heard a pin drop from everybody. Ah, ah. And then you looked. As far down as you could see, this guy was squared away. I mean, the creases in his pants, that smoking the bear hat tipped like this here, right? And he's looking at it. And he's like this size, and as you're getting closer, he's like this. And when you get off, he looks like he's like this, right? And they do everything they possibly can to break you, everything. You get off, the, they've got these little footprints you have to step in. And you have to say, sir, Private Battello requests permission to speak to the senior drill instructor, sir. If you didn't, bang! Am I, I'm telling you the truth now. They put gloves on, they beat the fire out of you. And I want to tell you something. I almost went to Leavenworth because I wanted to retaliate, but I didn't. <laughs> but the bottom, the bottom line is they give you a little red book. And in that little red book is all of the rules and the laws. And you have to study it. Because all of a sudden, 
the outside, you'll come out of chow. When you come out of chow, you have to take your little red book out and you're standing like this here at attention. And the drill instructor will come over, step in front of you. What's your 17th general auto, Marine? I don't know. Look it up. Yep. <laughs> no. I heard about a guy one day. <clears throat> When he wanted to speak to the drill instructor, see my office over there? The drill instructor always kept his office closed. So he had to walk up to it. I don't know if you can see me. I'll, I'll do it here. That's my door. And you had to go three times. You had to knock on the wall. And if you didn't get any response, boom, boom, boom. You hit it again. No response. Boom, boom, boom. And so the drill instructor said to one guy, I can't hear you. And the guy slammed it. Boom, boom, boom. He said, I can't hear you. And the guy said, how to blankety blank, you know I'm out here then. An arm came out of that drain and snatched the face inside. And all you hear was a pounding away. And how do you know I'm out here? He said. <laughs> but they do everything they can so you can learn the commandments of the Marine Corps. And that's why, beloved, and I mean this, how many of you have heard of Bella Wood? If you, it, that was during World War II, when you read about the Marines, how they took Bella Wood. The French couldn't do it. The Germans were, were hunkered down. They wiped out the French army. The British couldn't do it. And then they called these Marines, never been in combat before, and the uh, drill instructor, or, or excuse me, the sergeant said, there's one way. We're going into those woods, through those woods. We're going to rout these guys. And beloved, in four hours, the Germans were the ones that gave the Marines the name they devil dogs, <laughs> okay? Because there's no retreat in the Marine Corps. You're going to go over them, under them, around them, or through them, but you're going forward. You are going forward. That's what God wants us to do. Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have a right to the tree of life and may enter into the gates, into the city. Would you say amen out there? You see, beloved, what am I saying to you? I'm saying this. Some translations you may read say uh, who have washed their robes instead of blessed are they that do his commandments. But beloved, both of these terms are synonymous and they're basically the same showing man's part in salvation. Namely this, that through faith man has to cooperate with the grace and spirit of God to obtain and maintain the redemption Christ purchased for him on the cross. Amen? Obeying God's commandments, now I want you to get this, does not earn or merit our salvation. Obeying God's commandments, as I've taught my seminary students, is the evidence, the expression, the exercise of a true saving faith that works by love, that meets the conditions of God's grace so that He can save you. Would you say amen out there? In other words, if God says you're drowning and He throws you a line and He says, hold on to the line, I'll pull you in. If you don't hold on, God has thrown you the line, He's got the boat, He's got the life preserver, but you've got to do what? You've got to hold on as He's doing, he's trying to pull you in. And so we must cooperate with it. Now God could snap His finger and force us to do it, but there would be no love if or true belief if he did that, would they? You'd be under duress. He'd be forcing you against your will. Of course, he made us as free moral agents. So, beloved, what am I saying to you? I'm saying this. Paul says that it's not the hearers of the law who are just before God. It's the doers of the law who shall be justified in God's sight. Oh, hear me now. The Bible says in James, James, the Lord's half-brother, James 2.17, faith without works, that is works of faith, is dead being alone. The Bible says in James 2.24, see how that by works, that is prompted, moved, and motivated by faith, how by works a man is justified before God and not by faith only. Would you say amen? A lot of people are thinking, well, I believe. I don't have to obey. Well, I'll tell you something. If you want to get into the heavenly city, you better stop listening. The Bible says in James 1.22, Be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. Now listen carefully, beloved. Listen to me very, very carefully, because I want you to notice what it doesn't say. It doesn't say, blessed are they who just hear his commandments. It doesn't say, blessed are they who just believe his commandments. It doesn't say blessed are they who just read his commandments, but blessed are they that what? 
Do his commandments. Beloved, there is no other way to ever qualify to enter into the heavenly Zion. And if you don't obey, there'll be no heaven, there'll be no holy city, there'll be no new Jerusalem, there'll be no tree of life or water of life or paradise. For the unsaved, for the impenitent backslider, for those who say they believe but they're unfaithful, for the compromiser, for the world, there'll be no apostate that's going to get in, no disobedient or denier of God's word. Why would you want to go live in heaven with God where you have to really obey and you can't even do it down here? And you'll be doing it for all eternity. Why would you want to do it? And I've always said that to you, beloved. So, beloved, do you hear what the Spirit is saying? Are you marching to Zion with a faith that works and keeps God's commandments? Imagine Jesus walking around in John 14, 15. They're all following him like a, like a gaggle of hens behind him as he's He's, I told you, a, a peripatetic preacher. He would, he would be walking and talking over his shoulder and everybody would be following him like, like a bunch of chickens behind him. And Jesus turns around and he says, if you love me, then keep my commandments. Well, that kind of floor you, wouldn't it? He says, if you love me, keep my commandments. So those who profess faith in Christ and they do not obey His commandments, beloved, show that they really do not love Him. Amen? In 1 John 2, 4, the Bible says this, He that saith, I know Him, and keepeth not His commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in Him. Now, a lot of people, beloved, this, listen to me, true Christianity is like the special forces. You've got to love the truth. Remember, God says in the last days, those who do not love the truth, he will send them strong delusion that they will believe a lie. A lot of people are believing a lot of lies today. They're being taught that they don't have to obey, that they don't have to follow. They can do this, they can do that. Signs and wonders, whatever, beloved. I want to tell you something. Sign and wonder won't get you into heaven, but obedience will. Amen? So you have to love the truth. And beloved, I've got to tell you, sometimes the truth is a heavy cross to bear. And it's not going to be the majority who will be saved. It's always been, the Bible says, a what? A little remnant. A remnant, a little piece. You get a woman who goes to the store and she buys a bolt of cloth. They roll that bolt out and she cuts a little piece off. See, that's the remnant from it. God said that's what's going to be out of the, the real saints that want to follow the Lord. Amen? So, beloved, if you want to drink of the river of the water of life, if you want to eat of the tree of life, then you have to do that because Jesus said in Matthew 21 through 23, not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of God, but he that doeth the will of my Father shall. Many in that day will say unto me, Lord, Lord, have I not prophesied in thy name? Have I not done many wonderful works in thy name and cast out demons in thy name? And then Jesus said, and I will profess unto them, depart from me, ye workers of iniquity, I never knew you. What is iniquity? Iniquity is sinning against the light of truth that you know. That's iniquity. I know I should do this, but I'm not going to do it. See, that's iniquity. Transgression is to step over the line. When you transgress, no trespasses. So, beloved, you can see what God is talking about. It's very serious business what we're talking about this morning, isn't it? And I wanted it on TV. Because that's what God has called me for, to preach. So people can hear it. Somebody can say it. Amen? Now, don't you miss this. The blessed ones who obey God's commandments, the blessed ones who are allowed to enter and live in God's holy and heavenly city, know that it was because of their faith and total dependence on the power of God's Spirit and grace and not their own doing that made this possible. Amen? It was because they used the grace of God aright and that they were able to keep God's commandments and covenant with Him that they made through faith at baptism. When you got baptized, you're making a covenant with God. It's your marriage ceremony. Are you faithful to your marriage? I hope you are. How about your marriage to Christ? So I'm, Lord, I'm saying to you, I want to marry you and separate from this world. That's what you said at baptism. I'm burying this old man that was in the world, and I'm putting on the new man. Would you say amen out there? You see, beloved, so as the Bible warns, these commandment keepers, they did not use the grace of God in vain. 
As the Bible warns, they did not frustrate the grace of God. And as the Bible warns, they do not fail of the grace of God or turn from the grace of God or turn it into lasciviousness like a lot of people do today. As the Bible warns, beloved, they did not discontinue. The Bible tells us to continue in the grace of God. And so many people do not continue in the grace of God. And the Bible warns that these, or, or says that these people did not fall from the grace of God like so many believers do. Amen? Beloved, so many believers, because they've been taught wrong, misuse, and they abuse the grace of God, and they use it as a license to sin. But the faithful do as 2 Peter 3.18 says. They grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. You know, anything you grow in, I don't care what profession you're in, the more you go along, the more you mix it up, the more you're exposed to something, the more you have to research, dig, or whatever, the more you have to deal with, the more you have to experience, you grow. Amen? Well, that's what happens as a Christian. You grow. I know after all the years of ministry, beloved, I, 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 I've categorized it so many. You, you can almost read a person, uh, okay, because you've dealt with them and dealt with them and dealt with them. Um, but there's... Uh, uh, I want you to know what I'm saying here because I don't want people to think that it's anything that you're doing in and of yourself that's getting you into heaven. Now, beloved, listen to me. The commandment keepers know that they could never obey God's commandments. They could never live holy and righteous lives. They could never persevere in the faith and fight the good fight of faith. They could never turn or overcome from their sin, self, Satan, this evil world system. They could never be blessed apart from the grace of God. Notice what it says in verse 14, that they who do the commandments of God may have the right, the exousia is the Greek word, that they may have that high and holy privilege and honor and opportunity to now enter into the new Jerusalem, the city of God, and have full and free access and now partake of the tree of life and live forever in the new heaven and the new earth with Christ. And they could not do that, they know, without the supernatural power and help of the grace of God. Amen? In other words, the redeemed know that there's nothing that they ever did to earn and merit this infinite blessing, that it was now bestowed upon them. It was conferred upon them by God, so all the glory, praise, and honor goes to Him. But man's faith must cooperate with God must utilize this grace of God to obey His commandments, beloved, because God says these are the conditions, and I'll give you the power now to meet these conditions, but you have to do it. God doesn't repent for you. God doesn't believe for you. God doesn't obey for you, but He gives you everything to do all that, doesn't He? You see, beloved, the Bible says this in Matthew 24, 13. Jesus says, He that endureth to the end shall be saved. You know what I always learned uh, in the ministry, because you're always dealing with people. When they get fired up, I says, now unless God hits me with lightning, I'm going to outlast you. <laughs> okay. I will outlast you. I'll endure. Been here before. Done that. Been under the gun. Had my feet in the fire many times. I will endure with you. And I say to a lot of people, they're talking and talking. They don't know what they're talking about. Put your hand, I said, put your hand in the Bible with me. God judge between you and me. That's pretty serious, isn't it? Amen. You, know, you, know, you know what? I've never had anybody want to put their hand on the Bible with me. Because when you're doing that before God, He will justify who is to be, to be justified, and He will curse who needs to be cursed. He'll judge. See, the, the, the point I'm getting at, beloved, is this here. Jesus said this. Listen said that your faith must labor for the meat or the spiritual food that endures under eternal life. Jesus said, continue. Your faith must continue to obey him if you are to be his true disciples. Jesus said, you must strive to enter in. Paul said it like this in Philippians 3, 14, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high of God in Christ Jesus. Press, you know, press, you know you're going to get through, you're pressing, right? I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ. You say, Pastor, is that my major goal in life? Now you got it. My family is not my major goal in life. I love my family. My career is not my major goal in life. My major goal in life as your pastor, as your friend, is to cross the finish line. That's my major goal. 
It is to glorify the Lord and cross the finish line. Anything else? I told you I'd be a floor sweeper in heaven. That's all I want. I want no responsibility. None. (laughs) You think I'm kidding, but none. I don't want any of that. And so, beloved, uh, what I'm saying to you is this here. The church at Sardis, the Bible said, many in the church had defiled their garments. When you get saved, God gives you a robe of righteousness and holiness. Luther described it like this, that we're a dunghill covered with snow. Okay? So now, now, I'll tell you though, it's going to be like an igloo because you've got to start shoveling that dug on. You've got to make a doorway and get it out, get some good stuff in, okay? But the church at Sardis, Jesus said to them, He says, many of you have defiled your garments and are not worthy to enter into my heaven. So we don't ever want to defile our garments of righteousness, amen? Because we've been regenerated by the Holy Spirit of the living God and given the power of His grace, beloved. I don't want to use that or misuse it or abuse it. You know, in 1 John chapter 1, verse 7, it says, if we walk in the light as He is in the light, if we walk in the light of the truth of His word, will, and ways, if we moral and spiritual truth, As he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of his Son, Jesus Christ, continuously cleanses us from all of our sins. Amen. So unlike Adam and Eve who disobeyed God's commandments and were driven from the paradise of God and the tree of life, paradise lost is now paradise found for those who will keep the prophecies of this book. They're eternally blessed. God says, if you obey me, the paradise that was lost, I'm going to give to you. Isn't that a wonderful blessing? Isn't that motivate you, beloved? We all need to be motivated. If you were in the core, you'd be jogging, and this George talking said, motivation, motivate, inspiration, inspiration, perspiration, perspiration. That's <laughs> your motivation, inspiration, perspiration. Okay. So, beloved, God says this is 12 manner of fruit. You'll be eating from it, that perennial tree, again and again and again. Are you marching to Zion so you can do that, beloved? Because now you can forever enjoy God and Christ and the Holy Ghost if you do. Now you can ever spend time with the holy angels and the saints of all ages. Now you can forever enjoy heaven and paradise and the city of God and eat of the tree of life and drink from the water of life, beloved. Number five. Uh, I got 15 points. I just want you to know that. I'm only kidding. (laughs) Number five. The prohibited individuals. Look what it says in verse five. Uh, uh, excuse me, verse 15. Jesus says, For without, outside the city, excluded, are dogs and sorcerers and whoremongers and murderers and idolaters and whosoever loveth and maketh a lie. Look over chapter 21, the last verse, verse 27. And there shall in no wise enter into it, the city, anything that defileth, neither whatsoever worketh abomination or maketh a lie, but they that are written in the Lamb book of life. I want you to notice, beloved, that Jesus is saying that masses of people are going to be excluded from entering the holy city, the city of God. And these lists of sins that prohibit one from going in, beloved, are not exhaustive. They are but illustrative of all those who are unforgiven and unrepentant of their sins. And we don't have time to go there, but you may want to do it for your afternoon devotion. In Matthew 25, Beloved, verses 31 through 46, Jesus said that the Son of Man, when he comes back and sits on the throne of his glory on the day of judgment at his second advent, then there's going to be a final separation of all men to determine their eternal destination, either heaven or hell, in accordance with their faith and works. Then King Jesus will eternally separate the saved from the unsaved. Then King Jesus will eternally separate the sheep from the goats, the wheat from the tares. Isn't that what he says? Then King Jesus will separate the professors from the possessors. Then King Jesus will eternally separate those who are truly the citizens of heaven and those who are not the citizens of heaven and whose names have been blotted out of the book of life. Our beloved King Jesus will then consign those people, both of those groups, to their eternal abode of either glory or glory. So I'm saying this, beloved, we're in the last days of earth's history right now. I believe Jesus is coming back soon. That this age of probation will abruptly end and the doors of his mercy are going to slam shut 
on the hinges of his grace. And the time is coming when no one can ever again be saved. Think about it. What, if you knew he was coming tomorrow and you don't know about it today, no one else can give it. There'll be no pleading. There'll be no plea bargaining. Either you're saved or you're lost, one or the other. And God says he's going to have to be a great, it's called the greatest size. Okay, he's going to separate both the groups. And so, beloved, I'm saying to you, I urgently and lovingly ask you, are you marching to Zion like this, beloved? Or, or are you a lukewarm Christian? What does God say he's going to do with a lukewarm Christian? You tell me. He will spew or vomit them out of his mouth. Lastly, and I'll close with this and I'll make it quick. The punitive indictment. Look what he says in verses 18 and 19. For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book, if any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of the prophecy of this book, you can see why I'm preaching the truth. <laughs> God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city. And the book of life, beloved, some translations say the tree of life. And from the things which are written in the book. The point is, I want you to notice the solemn and emphatic warning here by the Holy Spirit. He says no one must ever add to or take away from the words that are written in the book of the Revelation and by extension the whole Bible. To carelessly and irreverently tamper with the word of God is to commit moral and spiritual and eternal suicide, beloved. It's to curse and condemn yourself and damn yourself to hell. I want you to listen to what God says in Deuteronomy 4.2. He says, You shall not add unto the word I command you, neither shall ye diminish or take away from it, but rather you are to keep the commandments of the Lord your God. The, God warns in Deuteronomy 12.32. He says, Whatsoever I command you, observe to do it. Thou shalt not add thereto or diminish from it. Oh, it's dangerous, beloved, to tamper with God's word. And God warns in Proverbs 30 and verse 6, Add thou not unto his words, lest he reprove thee, and thou be found a liar. And we just read, no liar will inherit the kingdom of God, beloved. Notice what happens to those who do this. It says that God takes away their share out of the holy city, the new Jerusalem. It said God takes away their share out of the book of life, and they can't drink of the water of life, and they can't eat of the tree of life, beloved. And God says, I'm going to take away your share of all the blessings, all the promises that are in the Bible that I promised I would give you in Christ Jesus. So instead, what does he do? God says, now I'm going to afflict you with all of the plagues. How many of you have read the book of Revelation through before? Raise your hand. Everybody, right? Are there plagues in here that God's going to inflict the whole world with? Beloved, that's why the Bible says pestilences, viruses, all these different things in the last days and scientists and a lot of doctors are wrestling with. They don't have a clue what it is. But I'll tell you, beloved, a lot of it is sent by Almighty God himself. And he tells us it's going to be his curse on mankind for rejecting his son after he's pleaded with them for millenniums to come to the Lord. Well, let me conclude, beloved. This is what I want to ask you. Are you marching to Zion or are you going in another direction, the opposite direction in your life? Not towards God, but away from God. You say, preacher, how do I know if I'm marching to Zion? Well, beloved, if you try to live a holy, and righteous, and godly life, then you're marching to Zion. If you're trying to obey God's commandments and live according to his word, will, and ways, then you are marching to Zion. Amen? If you're trying to be a faithful and a fruitful Christian, then you're marching to Zion. If you're trying to serve the Lord, beloved, and sacrifice for the Lord, then you're marching to Zion. If you're trying to make Christ in his word the Lord and authority of your life and surrendering to it, then you are marching to Zion. Would you say amen out there? If you're daily reading your Bible and you're praying and you're studying, you're marching to Zion. If you're trying to share the gospel with people and have a burden for their souls, you're marching to Zion. I remember a couple years ago, I got my wife a car and the, the, the Salesman started dealing with me, and, and years ago I used to sell cars. And I said, with all due respect, I said, I, wanna, I used to sell cars. I said, give me your best shot. And I said, and this is what I'm willing to pay for this. And I wrote a piece of paper, and I put it down there. And the guy looked at me. He said, you've done this before, huh? I said, I have. I said, I want to speak to your sales manager. 
Well, you know what? The sales, sales manager wanted to hire me, right, Don? <laughs> sales manager wanted to hire me. And I was going somewhere with that illustration. But uh, any, any, anything you can, I can take, Doc, for this? <laughs> I was going somewhere with that. Um, does anybody know? <laughs> oh, yeah. So I, uh, I got one person listening in the whole church. <laughs> And that's uh, Sean. Uh, I mean David, excuse me. Oh, God. And so I, I started giving him the gospel. And I mean, we're sitting there, people walking by, and he's, he, he doesn't know to turn, go right, left, or whatever, right? And uh, I said, I want to speak to your sales manager, too. So I gave them both the gospel. And I said, I just want you to know this. I said, that I am a minister. I am a true Christian. My wife's a true Christian. This car breaks down. I'm going to pray you get boils. He says, you wouldn't do that. I said, uh-huh. <laughs> I'm going to pray you get boiled. My hands are so fast. <laughs> like Muhammad Ali. Muhammad Ali, I have thrilled in Manila with a gorilla. <laughs> when he fought Joe Frazier down there. But beloved, if you're not doing these things, you're never going to see the heavenly Zion. In Hebrews 12, 22 through 24, it states those who were seeking after God, it says, but you are come unto Mount Zion and unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn whose names are written in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, to the spirits of just men made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than the blood of Abel. Abel's blood cried out for vengeance. Jesus' blood cries out for vindication. Abel's blood cried out for justice. Jesus' blood cries out for justification. Abel's blood cried out for punishment. Jesus' blood cries out for pardon. Amen? Now's the time. Are you marching to Zion. Let's go to the throne of grace.